the literary genre of the international thriller often winds its way through the Middle East, and for good reason. By way of example, in Shadow Strike, Jerusalem Post editor-in-chief Yaakov Katz tells the actual story of Israel's secret operation to deny nuclear capabilities to Syria, a life-or-death mission as riveting as any told by Jack Carr or Brad Thor, but it's true. Yaakov Katz, thanks for joining us in studio at the Media Line. Thank you, Felice. Before we go into the intrigues, set the scene for the mission against the Syrian reactor. What was being built? How dangerous to Israel was it? And how difficult was the decision to do what Israel did? Basically, in the summer of 2006, we all know, and this is just important for context, but Israel fought a war against Hezbollah for 34 days. And it was perceived very much in Israel as being a bad war. A war that ended with poor results, with too many casualties, with too many rockets that pounded the Israeli home front for those 34 days of war, over 4,000 rockets hit Israel. And Israel was in this process of rehabilitation. It was learning and studying the lessons. There were commissions of inquiry on a state level, on a military level. But across the board, it was exhaustive. There were calls for the prime minister to step down at the time, Ehud Olmert, for the chief of staff to leave office, for the defense minister to have to also resign. And at the same time, in March of 2007, so we're just seven months after that war, in the midst of this rehabilitation, the Mossad, Israel's equivalent of the CIA, gets intelligence about a Syrian nuclear scientist who's going to be traveling to Vienna. They break into this guy's hotel room, and he had left his laptop computer behind. And they download the contents of his laptop computer, and they hit the jackpot. On this computer, they find photos of a nuclear reactor being built in northeastern Syria along the Euphrates River. And the kicker of it all was this one photo of that Syrian scientist standing and posing for a photo in front of the nuclear reactor together with a man who turned out to be the North Korean nuclear scientist who runs North Korea's Yongbyon nuclear reactor. So not only is Syria building a nuclear reactor that could pose an existential threat to the state of Israel and is close to completing it, but this is being done for Syria by another dangerous, rogue, violent regime, the one in Pyongyang. Was that a turning point in terms of the United States and Israel cooperating on that level? I think what happened with the Al-Kibar nuclear reactor in Syria definitely was a turning point. They had come after years of the CIA feeling that the Mossad had lost its, its gravitas, that it had lost its magic touch, its dagger between the teeth type of legendary operations that it was not doing those anymore and and this brought them back to the forefront. The intelligence showed that Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian president, had not told anyone about this nuclear reactor or just a handful of people. His defense minister didn't know, his chief of staff didn't know, none of his cabinet really knew, just a handful select of really shadowy secret characters who surrounded him knew about what was really happening up in this Deir Azur region. And Israel gambled that if it stays quiet Assad would not would prefer to sweep it under the rug and not retaliate. And they weren't sure how it would play out. There were predictions in the military that an assault and a, the destruction of this nuclear reactor could lead to a war with Syria, at least a 50% chance. And this is Syria pre-civil war, Felice. This is Syria with more tanks than we have, more soldiers than we have, Scud missiles that can reach any point inside the state of Israel, chemical and biological weapons by the tons. Uh, this would have been a formidable opponent for the state of Israel. But Israel decided that if it stays quiet, Assad will stay quiet. And that required of Olmert also to remain silent, never to take credit, never to say a word, never to say, look what I did on your behalf, look how I saved the nation. When you think about the leaders that we have around the world today, just, you know, 13, 12 years later, and without naming names, but you look at this, we live in something of an era of populism today, and you look at these populist leaders, and I wonder often, would they have been able to stay quiet? How will that go down in history? I think, in my view, right, this is a this was a, a heroic moment for Olmert in that sense, right? It was one thing to stand up to the U.S. president who didn't want him to attack. That was impressive. I don't know that other leaders would do that. It was another thing to be able to withstand the pressure and still go ahead. But then this remaining silent, while it seems so small, I think when you think of the politicians and you compare today to then, it's interesting, and it's something that should give us pause. We've just discussed Ehud Olmert as a leader denied his most important moment before the public. He has now returned to the public eye, sharing the podium with Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas as a critic of the Trump-Kushner vision for peace. Any thoughts? 
first and foremost, the Palestinians are continuing with this path of intransigence and they're, they're not interested in, 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 in really moving forward. And the, the proof is what Abbas said at that meeting is that we have to go back to those agreements that you and I had when we negotiated 12 years ago and I'm ready to start from the point that we ended. Well, seriously, where were you for 12 years? But with that said also, I think that Olmert, despite really uh, having an, a heroic moment in the Book of Shadow Strike and in the story of the Syrian nuclear reactor is still perceived by the Israeli public to have been a corrupt politician. On the other hand, I think that this double standard that I see in the Israeli political arena troubles me more. So what that Omar met with Abbas, right? The people saying he's meeting with the terrorist, I've seen that over throughout social media. Prime Minister Netanyahu was hugging and embracing Yasser Arafat back when he was Prime Minister between 96 and 99. He was the one who voted for the disengagement from Gaza in 2005. He was the one who signed the Hebron Agreement that allowed the Palestinian police to deploy inside the city of Hebron. He, he was the one who froze settlement construction back in 2009 to 2010 is the first time. How come no one's calling him out that on that? So question. that double standard. The, the real question here is why is the public just turn a blind eye? Well, I think there's an attempt to rewrite history. I think there is an attempt by some people on the right who are supporters of Netanyahu to pretend that all of that didn't happen. But it did happen, right? And, and that's fine. In other words, I think that... Mahmoud Abbas in this case also, we have to keep in mind, he is a Palestinian leader. He might not come to the table, he might be a rejectionist, but he still is one who denounces terror. He is one who calls on his security forces to continue to coordinate with the Israeli military, which helps save Israeli lives as well as Palestinian lives, and keep Hamas at bay and preventing it from popping up in the West Bank at a time that there's no diplomatic progress on any level. So would we not, we don't, that's not the type of leader we should be trying to engage with and make peace with. Now, on the other hand, Yasser Arafat, we know, orchestrated the Second Intifada, personally and proudly funded and financed and supported uh, and gave logistic support to suicide attacks against the state of Israel, murdered hundreds, of, if not thousands of Jews, right? And th so that's someone, uh, this double standard is just, in my eyes, hypocritical, unacceptable. The Trump Kushner vision for peace and prosperity, in one word, how would you describe it? I think it's impressive, right? And one word. <laughs> impressive. Okay. Do you think that it has a chance? I'm a skeptic. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it has much of a chance, and it's possible that we'll sit here in a year from now and we'll try to recall what was that deal that someone had once put out on the table, because take a, the possibility Trump loses in November, Netanyahu doesn't win in the upcoming election or in the election that might come after that. So its potential to change, though, and to really make a difference, is if it's if it's taken and parts are start to be implemented it moves the goalpost right it changes the paradigm but for that to work the palestinians have to come to the table you know one of the mistakes that maybe they made was m turning or pushing aside the palestinians throughout this process uh, they thought that they would eventually come maybe because of economic benefit or because of pressure from the arab world that's turning away from them and had enough of being held back by the Palestinians. They want to engage more with Israel. They want to engage more with the United States. That remains to be seen if that works, right? Maybe it will. And if it does, hats off to the Trump administration. But if it doesn't, we haven't really gone anywhere. Yaakov, your background, defense and military reporter at one point, and you, of course, were studying in Harvard. So you've had a lot of credentials in terms of writing and in terms of defense. What spurred this book? I was the military reporter when this happened. And I felt that something had, that the story had not been told and that there was a bigger story here. And while in Israel we knew little tidbits of, yes, the Air Force attacked it, yes, the Mossad discovered it, but what, what about in between? What about the Israeli-U.S. relationship here, which is a key part of the book, of how Ulmer decides to share this intelligence with the Americans, and the Americans go through this whole process on their own of what they should do. Should they attack? Should they not attack? And, and how this could have been a point of friction and tension and, and a crisis between the two countries, but it actually strengthened the relationship between the two countries. So it speaks volumes to the, the, the vibrancy and the resilience of the Israeli-American military and diplomatic alliance. Uh, I think that that's what makes the story so fascinating. Yaakov Katz, thank you so much. The book, Shadow Strike, Inside Israel's Secret Mission to Eliminate Syrian Nuclear Power. And it's published by St. Martin's Press. Thank you. Thank you very much.